today's episode of Virtual Sentiments, I talk to Dr. John Coffold, founder of machine learning company Deep Learning Analytics and a member of the advisory board for Data Community DC. We started developing this podcast, Virtual Sentiments, in August 2022. And since then, the topic of artificial intelligence has become more and more popular in our news, in schools, in our work lives. Personally, I've been pretty frustrated with how much hyperbole seems to be at play in the way that some people talk about AI. It makes it really hard for people like me, and I assume many of you, who don't have the technical expertise to really evaluate what both boosters and sometimes critics of the technologies argue. A major theme of this podcast is that technological changes are always shaped by our politics and the decisions that we, human beings, make as individuals, as members of communities. So by having both extensive computer science expertise and related business experience, John's perspective really exemplifies how we might cut through the hype with nuance, pragmatism, and precision. So while this episode will not offer thrilling visions of AI as our saviors or our annihilators, I hope you'll come away with a better handle on what these technologies do and the more mundane capabilities and risks that they already entail. Thank you for talking with us today, John. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the chat. Yes, I'm looking forward to the chat too. I'm so excited um, because as as we've discussed, I think that AI, <laughs> and we'll get into that term as we as we chat, has been a very hot topic for the past year um, and, and longer, but I think especially for the past year, um, people concerned about the rise of LLMs or chatbots, um, and so I'm I'm excited that we're going to be able to talk to you and get your perspective and your expertise on what is really a fundamentally a very technical area of research, um, but also something that is something that everybody's talking about. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and to start us off, would you mind introducing yourself and your work? Sure. I'm professionally, I guess, so I have 30 years of experience in artificial intelligence, which I think is rare and unusual. And uh, usually when people in my field do, quote, AI work, they probably call it machine learning or ML. And so 30 years, actually 31 now. Oh, man. So I started in 93 in a speech recognition lab in Boston and my formal training was as a scientist and engineer. I got a PhD in biomedical engineering, Boston University in 2001. And I did uh, machine learning in, so first speech recognition, then a lot of image recognition uh, applications and image data science applications, something you might call computer vision. And around 20 years into that, uh, in 2013, that's when I started that company, Deep Learning Analytics, and I spent eight years there. And that is the longest single thing I've ever done professionally. But that startup experience is qualitatively different from the technical individual contributor roles I had prior to starting that company. The company was very much, what's the business of AI? And all the other stuff before it was, what's all the technical stuff? So... I have this, again, rare experience that's at the intersection of those two things. And a lot of that, I I think, is what frustrates me when I talk to people about AI nowadays, because let's say I'm talking to a business person, they will often get the AI wrong, and that frustrates me. And, And they get frustrated when the tech doesn't work the way they think it should they imagine it does or the way they read about in the media. So that's that's a frustration. And I I also get frustrated with technical folks, like the really technical folks who somehow elevate AI to almost a a religious type of devotion that that technical bit is the most important part. And really what, what we do AI for is to get business value. And when tech folk don't respect the business value, 
that also frustrates me. Anyway, so that's that's my background in a nutshell. Now, I'm not saying there's no one I can talk to about it. There are a handful of 10, 20 folks that know both the, you know, the business of AI and the tech behind AI, and they know who they are. And I very much enjoy uh, our discussions. No, that's awesome. And that is such a, a unique set of insights, as you've said. Um, and and even the kind of thing that requires kind of collective collaboration, but also is a unique, um, you have a unique individual perspective that is valuable. And so one of the reasons why I was really excited to talk to you is that we have this increasingly popular discourse around the ethics and politics of Whatever term you want to use, so um, often people are talking about artificial intelligence. Sometimes people use the notion of automated decision-making systems. Um, I feel like I also see that a lot in policy work. And it, it, I do worry that it seems like there's a, a problems in how we talk about these technologies and perpetuating misunderstandings of these from all various perspectives. And so... I, I, what I am concerned about is the, the very way that we talk about these technologies and policies related to them, things like the call for the moratorium or other regulatory actions can end up impacting the very conversation that we're having and how people understand uh, these processes, these technologies and potential policy decision making. And that the way that we talk and understanding these terms is going to shape how, whether or not we find these technologies beneficial when we figure out the ways for them to be beneficial rather than being harmful. So I, I, to kind of get us started on that, uh, I would also, so I, I would be interested in kind of you helping us think about how you think about the term AI uh, versus the term machine learning, for example, kind of things that you would want to, uh, whenever you're, you're hearing or reading something in the media uh, that makes you feel frustrated or, or kind of how you get around this, this talking past each other in the discourse. Well, thank you. That, that is one, of, like, I think I just mentioned it as one of my core frustrations. So thank you for focusing on that to start. Also, if we're going to talk about this for the rest of the podcast, it would be good to know what we're talking about and, and agree on those terms. However, you, it, it might feel like a trap, though. You asked part, partly there, hey, what's the difference between AI and ML? And that's kind of a long walk, especially for someone who's been doing this for 30 years. So, um, yes, I do think it's true that we talk past each other a lot when it comes to AI. And I, I think that misunderstanding folks in general right now, especially on social media, is a part of our zeitgeist. Uh, it's, I mean, we see it in politics and we also see it in business. We obviously see it in AI. Um, so it's not a problem specific to AI, but it's obviously very uh, central to people misunderstanding AI. And um, just like you have straw, straw man arguments on in politics, you have similar kinds of arguments, you know, straw people arguments in debates as well. And people aren't even talking using the same terminology. Uh, but yeah, there is this, I think, dramatic tension between the forces of good and the forces of evil when talking about AI. And on the forces of good, you have organized, rational thought and, and empirical evidence for things. And then the force of evil, you have people that sometimes unwittingly are just sowing confusion and defensiveness by conflating terms and making people then retread. What are we even talking about? If I had to pick one villain in that drama, it would be that AI is an overloaded term. People use that for everything. And it doesn't mean everything. It's colloquial. It's imprecise. But people think it's precise enough to talk about and even craft policy about. And in my opinion, it's just my opinion, it's an especially bad term to use in policy. Uh, it's, it's so broad and imprecise. It would be like craft policy. We want to reduce the badness of X. Well, there's already a problem because the badness, you, if, if AI is that term, you need to define that and hopefully make it something more measurable. And I'm not even talking about, quote, AI down to the, you know, the fourth decimal place of understanding where, you know, you would get a degree in it. I'm talking about like 
the first significant digit in the term AI. What does it mean? Um, and I don't think we, we even have that. Yeah. No, that's a great way to put it. And so I think, you know, often, what, what, what do we gain then by using a term like machine learning? How can we kind of dig into that term and get more precise about um, what we're talking about if we're talking about machine learning? So by example, I would say that uh, I was reading a policy document like a few years ago, and I remember the two definitions, they, they did have a definition for ML and they did have ML, machine learning, and they did have a de definition for AI. And the ML definition was barely even one line. It was just finding and using patterns in data. And I would argue that's correct. That's, I've used that same kind of terminology when defining the term myself. But then when they talked about AI, they went on for nine pages to define it. So that in and of itself is something that you can't get consensus on in popular discourse if it's that complex. Another issue, besides it being in my, I argue they're undefinable, it's also a moving target. So Sequoia Capital, they recently had a piece they called the, the AI and Frontier Paradox. And they were arguing that AI keeps becoming the term for the new technology, whatever it is. So AI changes as a function of time based on what, what's appearing in the literature and the market. Um, so beyond just being broad, so broad as to be undefinable, it's also a moving target. So AI, I think, has a lot of baggage that the further away we are from it, uh, the better, especially in debates and policy crafting and rulemaking. Great. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And so sort of, I think why we want to kind of dive into some of these, like you said before, we should start the conversation off with kind of what exactly are we talking about? And so uh, for a broader audience, I know that not everybody would be familiar with, so the idea of supervised machine machine learning and the, the idea of deep learning specifically, um, and also how those are different from both of those types of terms are distinct from the idea of automation. So kind of how, and then automation itself being distinct from autonomy. So kind of, can you help us kind of dive into those different concepts, the key terms that people might hear uh, thrown around. Sure. Yeah. The, the, the broadest one I would say here uh, when we're talking about AI, AI is a superset and then within it is machine learning, ML, and then within machine learning is are different kinds of learning. There's unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, supervised learning. Supervised learning is often what people are talking about uh, when they're talking about recent AI models like, like G, uh, chat GPT and other things that recognize objects and images, for instance, and supervised deep learning would be when that model is a deep neural network. So you, you go from the very broad of AI down to ML, down to supervised ML, down to supervised deep learning. And so if I were starting a conversation and, I, and like I said, AI is undefinable, but the way I think of it is using a, a compute infrastructure other than the human brain to perform a task, usually a narrow task, that's colloquially understood by the person you're talking to as something that's understood to be only possible to be done by a human brain, or at least it was in the past. Machine learning, like I said, is finding patterns in data. Supervised machine learning just means you're going to show a model in training a bunch of examples of, say, like, let's say you're looking for objects and images. You showed a bunch of examples of images with certain say, categories of objects, maybe cats and dogs. And then what you're going to give it after, after it's trained is a, is a new picture of a cat or a dog and see whether it gets that label correct, whether it's a cat or a dog. That's supervised machine learning. Supervised deep learning just means that you're going to use deep learning as the model. And deep learning almost always means a deep neural network, at least in you know 2024. So automation does not necessarily need machine learning or AI to be part of it. You can automate things just by writing code. Um, so uh, that is also something that gets conflated often um, and. Uh, I would not argue, I, I, I wouldn't recommend the first thing that people do with AI is automate some task. They should really put a human as the person vetting 
the thing that's coming out of the AI. So it should really be semi-automated. Um, and autonomy, autonomy is, is not automation either because autonomy, usually you have to coordinate a bunch of individual tasks, like automate, that's a task. Autonomy I think of as typically having many tasks, like sensing things, doing things in the environment, and eventually that will imbue a system with something like uh, agency, um, where it's kind of making its own decision and, and doing, and that's not automation. We, we, we seem to be we seem to be more accepting of automation than autonomy, and probably for good reason. I was just going to I was just going to finish with with all of these systems, there are other things that you want to focus on too that aren't specific to AI. Yet we talk about them all the time and only in regards to AI, things like fairness, accountability, transparency, interpretability, privacy, safety, security, reliability, compliance. These things are things we want for society and we want them, whether a human's doing a task, whether a task has been automated, whether it's semi-automated, whether there's an autonomous agent doing something. So that's another thing that I think is difficult to talk about. Yeah, no, that's a very excellent point, because I think that that's also at the heart of many, the sort of rise of conversations around AI ethics in philosophy departments, all these different disciplinary areas, and, and also the um, ordinary public are concerned with these potential issues, but also why we need to kind of dive into the specifics of it, because it is very different. Um, no, I don't want to go too far, but I think what we'll be just kind of flag what we'll be talking about later is people talking about kind of existential risk in AI and whether or not these conversations around existential risk in AI is really true to the current machine learning uh, technologies that are used in various ways, um, as well as the potential risks that exist right now versus these hypothetical risks that we're going to, uh, that people are worried about in the future, but it's still not clear what those would actually look like. Um, and it would get to more of what you've described as, I think, the autonomy issue, um, whether or not there's, you know, a technology that has more autonomy than anything that we have currently. Would that be correct? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I love that you're bringing up this point about things like long-termism being distracting from the harms that are actually happening right now with AI. And Tim Nickerbrew has done a really great job kind of talking about the, I guess, the philosophical lineage of the current system, AI technology and the, the leaders in that field and pointing out that there's a lot of baggage that uh, I would say philosophical, but ethical baggage that's distracting us from solving real problems like hey, uh, are we going to use AI in a way that's fair in approving loans, for instance? Because people are being harmed right now by that, uh, by mistakes there, for instance. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's an excellent example. Yeah, and Tim and Gabriel's work is, is phenomenal. So I'm so glad that you brought that work up. So yeah, so then let's dive in a little bit more deeply. What are some terms that you would use that are more useful for gaining traction on talking about machine learning? Well, I mean, as a professional, we use very dull terms. We will typically talk to each other about, say, a use case. A use case is fundamental in, uh, in ML. Like, for instance, one use case might be speech and text. The input of, of a use case is one part and the output is the other. So in speech to text, the input is an audio waveform. The output is the, the sequence of words. Then there's a model. That's the thing that was trained to convert those things. Then there's data. That's all the, let's say, all the training data and all the data that you're going to evaluate on to say how well you did in terms of speech to text, if that's your use case. And the data is really just computer representation of lots of objects. And we talk about compute, meaning how much compute does it like Think of counting the number of adds and multiplies, so the total number of floating point operations it takes to train a model. Uh, that's central to things that professionals talk about. And we talk about performance. We talk about, for instance, for speech to text, word error rate. How many words do we get wrong out of, say, a thousand words? And we talk about data split. 
we don't train and test on the same data. So we talk about how much we trained on, how much we tested on, how big the error bars were. We talk about systems that are in production. So when I was doing speech recognition research back in, say, 93, that was in a lab. There, there was nothing in production. We were just seeing how well it did, how well you could take a speech wave. And it wasn't, didn't do well. It, it, it was a really high error rate. But now we have Siri. That's in production. In production is something where you say something and words show up on your phone, text words. And we talk about things like provenance. Where did the data come from? Where was it ultimately sourced from? Because that's super important to machine learning models. We also talk about ML talent and data professionals because they are kind of specialized roles. Um, so we talk about those things. And if you go back to performance, all those ethical things that we just talked about and basically philosophical things associated with ML, they typically will get grouped under performance. So in performance, you could have, say, KPIs, how, how much better does an ML model do than some baseline performance? How much faster can you do that use case? How much uh, can you save in terms of dollars by using ML for that use case? But then you also have all those other things that you need to define, like security, privacy, transparency, et cetera, fairness. No, oh, excellent. That's a really, really great way to put it and a very, very helpful. It's striking to me too to talk about the idea of in production, um, because I think anybody listening to this, and maybe I, I don't have the handle on the term correctly, and you can correct me, but anyone listening to this, I think will probably have in mind OpenAI's ChatGPT and GPT-4. Uh, which were released in November 2022 and last spring. And these have been, you know, people engaging with this, there being this kind of emphasis on the technology being open and transparent in some ways, but then other ways in which it's, we don't have all the information about the data that's used to train the model, for example. Um, and so to kind of get us talking about those topics, I think it would be really good. And, you know, this is one of the goals of the podcast is if you could kind of give us take us back in time a little bit, um, even, you know, just 30 years ago, 31 years ago to the history of data science and machine learning as you experienced it firsthand and the way that there have been changes in the uh, discipline and and the the science um, over the course of your career and kind of where we started. Um, and like you said, the idea of the work that you were doing in a lab versus work that's done at a company and the other work that's done kind of in, again, this kind of movement toward this open engagement, getting kind of feedback from individual users by releasing a, a product out for free. Kristen, I'm going to try. That's difficult. So in some sense, some of the technology hasn't changed. For instance, a technology that we use today called backpropagation, that's, I don't know, uh, at least, I mean, the the modern version of it, we had that in the 80s before I was even in college. So that technology didn't really change. But what has changed are other things that you can empirically measure, things like how much data we have, uh, how much compute we have, and how much memory we have, for instance. And... If we're, if we're talking about what's happened during my career in 1993 versus, versus today, I think the biggest thing that's changed, I mean, the technology has definitely uh, evolved and we know how to do machine learning much better now than we did then. But what's really changed is how well ML performs, like the error rates that I was getting back in 1993, even on a very easy use case of just recognizing numbers on a telephone, they were just too high to be usable. But when I started, people would dismiss, quote, AI or machine learning because it got so much wrong. It made so many errors. Now, people are afraid AI is going to take their job because it makes so few errors. So that's the key historical change that's happened over the 30 years that I've been doing machine learning. Yeah, no, I'd love to just dive in specifically to kind of the processes of what was required in terms of data collection. And uh, I know you've discussed a little bit of the work of Feifei Li's work. So, all right. So I guess I could start with speech recognition, what didn't work. And well, I'm going to say it didn't work 
in terms of something that would be mainstream acceptable to people. It would get, say, four out of 10 words wrong. That's not a, that's not a product you're going to use. So it didn't make it the product. It was still research back in 93. But what data went into that? There was this organization called the Linguistics Data Consortium, and they would basically collect lots of different use cases. Say you're, you're making an airline reservation. Say you're saying a street name. Some is just conversational speech. Some is speech that you would hear in noisy environments. There were all kinds of different what they called benchmarks. And in that lab, we participated in a benchmark. Well, I didn't, it was really the grad students. I was an undergrad at the time. Uh, and they would spend all night in the lab, making sure their models were training, watching how performance changed as they did experiments. Because it was a short period of time they had to take the training data that was given to them by the benchmark. I forget, even, I, it, I think it was the Linguistics Data Consortium that might've even run it, but I forget who, who was the, the organization that ran the benchmarks. But that was something we all took super seriously. And as of, say, 93, it didn't work. It, we, were, we, were look, we were trying to figure out what was the state-of-the-art performance on these different tasks. And the one task that I would say is the, the key one, the, the scariest task, was the one where it was called Switchboard. And it, it had all these different things that made speech recognition harder. They, they had m multiple different speakers. So sometimes it was just a single speaker. And so you could learn how a speaker says something. They would have disfluencies. They would change their speaking rate. There were all kinds of things. There was noise in the background. There were all kinds of things that would break speech recognition systems. So that was the big scary one. And it did not work in 93. Like I said, you know, four out of 10 words wrong. And I, I also was doing computer vision between, so at GE Research, I was doing computer vision and computer system detection. And I also did some biology research. It was all pretty much computer vision. And I guess the, let's take one summary experience I had. I was at NIH and the head of the lab that I was visiting was looking at these results. We were, we were trying to draw boundaries around these cells. And he said, my six-year-old daughter could do better than and I couldn't disagree, but I also couldn't tell him because I was kind of the part of the team doing the work for him. I couldn't tell him, you know, you can't hire your six-year-old dog. Yes. Um, but yeah, there were, it didn't work uh, without a lot of research uh, dollars to do even what we consider simple tasks, maybe even drawing bounding boxes around people milling about a lobby, which you might think of as a really simple task. Um, so that was the history, say, 1993 to circa 2010-ish. So, yeah, let's talk about the flagship then uh, data curation that made possible what I'll call the ImageNet Big Bang. So let's also culturally talk about the research the, the research community and people that write technical papers in AI, 2010, 2011, it was only important if you solved some new ML problem. And you didn't really get a lot of credit for doing a lot of the data labeling. Um, that's what I was doing as an undergrad, by the way, at, in that speech recognition lab. I was doing the data, lab, the grunt work. But what Fei Fei Li did was she curated a giant data set that allowed something like benchmarks for object recognition. So now this is on, on images. And that became the ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge. And what that contains, the, the one that, that becomes the benchmark, is about a thousand images of about a thousand different categories of common objects that you can see. Things like planes, cars, dogs, boats, cats, et cetera. So it's about a, a million images you get to train on and then they test you on 150,000 images and they would mark an image correct. They call this the top five error rate. They would mark it correct if you got the correct label in your top five out of a thousand guesses. And that was the performance. In 2011, the best computer vision labs in the world got about 30% error on that. That's a technology that did not work. Um, so 2012, that's when the ImageNet Big Bang happens. And that, that's when Jeff Hinton 
Elias Sitzgever and uh, Elias Sitzgever was just in the news recently for the open AI ousting of Sam Altman, for instance, he was, he was on the board. And he, he is also one of my, one of my deep learning heroes, but uh, he and Alex net published a paper that got 15% error for top five errors. So that's having the error rate and all those other computer vision labs that have been doing that same task for decades, they got maybe 29%, maybe 28% error. So they didn't move much at all. And then there was this huge result. And that caught the eye of the computer vision community, especially because one, neural networks had historically been basically dismissed in the machine learning community for quite some time. Um, and they weren't even really a computer vision lab. They were really a machine learning lab. So that's what we call the ImageNet Big Bang. And I certainly was not predicting that that was going to happen. And I don't think anyone was expecting that giant uh, result just to come out of seemingly nowhere. But that wasn't the end of it because what they did. So culturally, another problem that I saw with the computer vision community was people wouldn't open source their code. So you didn't know what experiments they did. And they would basically keep their data to themselves. So everybody had to try to get performance metrics on their own data set, but then that wasn't comparable to others. So that's some issue. Here, Feifei Li had curated the data set, it's open to everybody. And the team from Toronto, they open sourced their code and permissively licensed it. So that made it available to everybody. Not only that, the compute infrastructure, it wasn't some giant compute cluster that they were using. They, they had written code to make use of GPUs. These NVIDIA GPUs, they were very cheap, like on the order of $300 back then. It was a GTX 580 with three gigabytes of memory each. So these are really small devices. They trained it for two weeks. This is something that any person, any software developer that had two GPUs GPUs at home, they could just take that code and run it themselves. That was huge. So that was 2013. They have the error rate. They were the only ones that trained on GPUs. In 2014, all of the top 10 used GPUs to train, and they were all doing something similar to what AlexNet. AlexNet is the name of that original 20, the 2012 model. But then by 2015, Microsoft had gotten the error rate down to like 3.5%. And the baseline performance by humans was around 5%. So that is a technology now that does work. But really, it, it, the, the big bang was people using GPUs and deep learning for it. And then, and also arguably the, uh, the open source, you know, saying how they trained the, the network. And then there were other frameworks that, you know, sprouted up after. He, he used a, a code base called CUDA ConfNets. Then there was something called CAFE. Then there's... Other ones, TensorFlow, PyTorch, but point is by 2015, deep learning had outperformed humans at a task that really only human, and n none of us were expecting that. Um, so that's the image of Big Bang. So that data curation that uh, Fei Fei Li did. So like we talk about the image of Big Bang and a lot of people only talk about Jeff Hinton and that team, but that was one year. Nobody uses that model anymore. AlexNet is what it's called. And it's, it's great. We, we, we all know what it is. And it was super important. Yes, it was historic. But you know what we reuse every year? <laughs> Fei Fei's, the data that Fei Fei Lee's team curated. Um, so that was the professional heroism that I think she doesn't get enough credit for. And it's, it's overdue. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I love that. And I, I, it's so helpful for understanding kind of this, this, science as a, in a sociological way. And also, I really appreciate you kind of highlighting uh, Fei Fei Li's work and how central it has been um, and maybe underappreciated. I mean, I try to stay abreast of a lot of the uh, media around these issues, and I don't think I um, ever saw her work highlighted. So, um, and also even just the way that you, you've you sort of told this narrative of um, the changes over time and how the different technological kind of advancements happened, the, the role of GPUs, for example, too, is I think very clear and it's something we don't get a lot. And, and I think, so I wanted to zero in on that idea of that sort of sociology of what's going on. And so that is to say, kind of the way that 
neural neural nets, I think you may have touched on this a little bit, but the 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 role that neural nets played because they weren't they were kind of sidelined for a long time, uh, my understanding from your discussions um, of them that they weren't as popular and they weren't really popular until ImageNet. Um, and so could you give us a little inside scoop on like kind of how the community treated neural nets and how that's how they how they have kind of risen to be so central to developments today? Sure. But before I answer the question about neural nets, the reason any of these models becomes elevated is because their performance is better. That was the, the big historical thing that I've seen over my career is performance go from so bad I use it to so good, I'm afraid it's going to take my job. But uh, so, so neural networks. So let's see. So back in grad school, that's the first time I really started using But I mean, the history is long, so it's going to be a really uh, bridge version. Back in the 50s, there were what we call, you know, 50s. And there, there were a few of them, these AI winners where there would be some result that would come out and then people say, okay, that, that technique is therefore doomed to failure. And neural nets were in kind of one of those AI winners. It's not that no one was doing any research on them. There were still people using them, but they were using them in ways that didn't get the performance that you get with, with other models. And, the, and so when I got to grad school, this is circa 1998. I mean, I was in grad school, 95 to 2000, but the four big criticisms you would hear about neural networks are one, that they underperformed. And that ends up being the most important part. Second is that they're opaque, meaning like you can't know how it's getting an answer. You just, you put an image and it says cat or it says dog, it says plane. You don't know how it did that. It's just, it's a, it's a complex, ineffable process, that whole mathematical model that takes the input and turns it into an output. So that, that opacity, the black boxness of it, that was another criticism. Another is that they were impractical to train, partly because we were using CPUs. CPUs have on the order of tens of cores. GPUs, back in, the, for the ImageNet Big Bang, those two GTX 580s, I think that they had 512 cores. So they were basically trained with a thousand cores. So I think it was like a hundred times more compute than uh, people who were training on CPUs were using. Then uh, there's also this thing, theoret so there was a theoretical algorithmic issue that if you started to make neural networks really deep, which is where we get the term deep learning, if you try to do that, it, the gradients, which are important to training, they would either explode or vanish. And that means at some point you could add more layers, but you're not going to get any increased performance. Um, so that whole vanishing gradient issue, vanishing or exploding gradient issue, that was another criticism. And all that was definitely fair in 1998. But Jan LeCun, he was, he was working on something called convolutional neural networks. And Specifically, he showed that you can get them, they're, they're kind of deep network. They had seven-ish layers. I think the network, the name network there is called Lynette. And he just kept working on that. So despite it being an AI winner for neural networks, he, and just to their credit, Yashu Bengio and Jeff Hinton also as like, they're kind of the three, I think, pioneers who just kept plugging at neural nets. They really believed in it. They kept going despite uh, their papers being rejected from conferences and publications, specifically said the word neural net in the title sometimes, but they just, they kept going. And I remember in, it was 2004, I was at something called the Learning Workshop in Snowbird, Utah, and Jan LeCun demonstrated a little RC car that was navigating with a convolutional neural net in real time. That, that was incredible. Uh, but they were still in practical train in 2010, then I did a sabbatical uh, at MIT's uh, computational neuroscience lab. And there we were training them on CPUs. We had a big cluster of CPUs, but that would still take like a month to train. So that was still incredible training. When AlexNet happened, they did a few things and these might be a little too technical to talk about, but one is they changed the nonlinearity between layers. That ends up being super important. It used to be that they would use things that look like S curves, and all they did was change it to something that looked like a, a ramp. They call it a rectified linear unit. 
yeah, I shouldn't use words like that. <laughs> I was going to say, I might need to ask you to define that, but that's okay. <laughs> they, 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 they made some changes. They used a technique called dropout. They did other kinds of normalization, but they, they tweaked the network to something. That, and they initialized it in a really specific way. That was very important. So there were lots of little things that were accumulating during that AI winter that in 2012, the whole community, like, the whole community got to see these things do work as we thought they could. We just never found the right, you know, combination of things to put together. And he here's that recipe. And then, like I said, that recipe was open source. So that's kind of my view on the rise of neural networks. And it starts with convolutional neural networks, but now things like uh, ChatGPT, that's based on another kind of model called a large language model, which is based on a transformer usually. Well, t today it isn't. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, and, and it's another kind of question kind of going off of from that narrative we were, we were talking about in the past 30 years, um, is that my understanding is that data really is, so as you said, the, the data set was really central, this open source data set that, wait, I'm sorry, is it Fei-Fei Li or? Fei-Fei Li, yeah, yeah. She's the one that curated ImageNet and then the whole organization called Linguistics Data Consortium that curated the speech recognition benchmarks, and then there are all kinds of NLP data sets that people use to train and test. Great. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of zero in on that on date with data because we have other episodes in this season about talking about data. Um, and that's just sort of a, a big, you know, big keyword buzzword today, <laughs> um, you know, data isn't new, <laughs> but, but specific in this context, it seems to me that enormous amounts of data has been really central to technological developments in this field. And I wanted to kind of zero in on how the sort of data collection processes were different in the labs uh, versus the way that data is used today when we're talking about things like LLMs and the projects of different, different sort of tech companies uh, scraping the internet for data, things like that. Kristen, that's a great question. It's also very hard to talk, to answer, but I will I will attempt. So one is these labs. Some of the data sets, like I was talking about, like the benchmarks, like that data you could buy the linguistic data consensus, and so anybody could get that. ImageNet, there it was curated. You could download images. So all of those were public, and there were plenty of public benchmark data sets. And there's even a site called papers with codes uh, that collects a whole bunch of different benchmark performances on more than 12,000 different individual use cases. And they're not all text or, you know, image uh, analysis, you know, object recognition or speech to text or things like that. I would say start there. There's also a Google data set search that helps people kind of be looking at the same data set. That's for academic work, typically, because they're, they're not going to have the resources to create their own data set often, it, at least one that's, that's relevant for deep learning task. So, some might, but by and large, I think if you look on papers with code and there's a, there's a specific part where they list state-of-the-art results, um, you'll see most of those being public data sets. So one thing you won't see, which I think you're getting at on papers with code is all those proprietary models that are trained on proprietary data. And yeah, you can't see them. You also don't, you can't really benchmark them. And even if you did try to benchmark those models because you don't know what they're training on, you don't know if you're going to give them something they already trained on and memorized. So it makes that even more difficult. And GPT, all of its iterations, there is that issue. We don't know what it, exactly what it trained on. So it makes assessing it even more difficult. But in general, it, what ML professionals want to do is they want to find a narrow task, one of those use cases, some, some input and some output. And like, so let's take, let's take JetGPT as an example. So they used uh, at least one source of data, something called the pile. This is basically just scrape the internet. Um, and we still don't, and, and I, I say, most of it, be, or at least a big part of it, because we don't really, they don't say what they used to train on, right? We don't know what OpenAI uh, used to train its models. So, and that, that original sin also creates, you know, mistrust, fear. So 
when you train on the pile, the model you get reflects the broadness and messiness of that data set because it's not really a use case. You know how like Feifei Lee's curation, that was a use case, image in and then these specific categories out. Pile is the internet. So it's, it's got to learn to be a kind of jack of all trades to do well on predicting the next word on that data set. And that's kind of what it what its performance metric is. So that means it'll need to know how to bake sourdough, code in Python, uh, code in JavaScript, answer legal questions, and I'm sure it knows how to insult strangers on the internet. But, but that was, to me, unusual. Most of the work that I had done was very focused on narrow tasks. So GPT, to me, was something new. And also that it went, so it kind of, so OpenAI kind of started as something that looked more like an academic lab and was doing marketing. And the early versions, they would say, we trained on this. This was how big the, mo the most recent paper, they didn't give a lot of the details. That said, uh, there have been reports of exactly how big the model is, what um, guesses as to what data it used, et cetera. So point, the point is OpenAI's, uh, you know, ChatGPT is broader and makes it to me something qualitatively new and that, that it's not really described in detail as open as something like, say, Facebook's Llama 2, which is another model where you now do know a lot more about it, how big it is, how they train it, et cetera. So, yeah, it, it, and we have those different schools of thought. So, for instance, OpenAI's work right now is kind of behind both a paywall and this, you know, veil of secrecy. And Facebook's is more open. It's really not 100% open, but open enough to be academically useful. Yeah. I think that's actually, that is itself just a really important point that I feel like is really lost. And it's very easy to... You know, open source is a very, and also the idea, like this sort of broader concept of open data is a very, also a very kind of popular topic today. Um, but then there's sort of what does that actually mean? And when you drill down into a particular entity or a particular particular organization or structure or, or system, even, you know, uh, it, it's not always clear if it's actually meeting the metrics of openness, such as, such, such that, you know, a separate academic team can kind of replicate, for example, what, what is being done or, or something like that. So I, th I think that that was, that was helpful. Absolutely. That reproducibility issue is central. It's not just in, in AI. I mean, we have a reproducibility crisis in science in general, but definitely, especially for something as uh, sort of important in the market as AI right now and for as, for as big a player as open AI is, it is definitely an issue right now. And I wish it were different. I wish we had a way to reproduce, replicate, and assess. Also, what was different about GPT than the... Because that was this, this big model that happened in late 2023, or I'm sorry, late 2022. And what's interesting is there wasn't really a lot new to it in terms of technology. There was really just more data, more compute, and it was a bigger model that they trained. And so that, and, and the, what's, what I thought was really interesting, I went back and saw, so back in, it was 2016 or 2017, Jensen Huang, of uh, the CEO of NVIDIA, they went, he went to OpenAI and gave them the first of this big flagship DGX1 supercomputer. Like this helped them do their experiments much faster. Back when people thought of it as a nonprofit and it was still, not not the thing that it's become this uh, this thing that people have mixed feelings about, and they interviewed two of the scientists. I have great respect for both of them. One is Ilya Skever, the other one is Andre Carpathy, and they both said exactly what they were going to do. They said we're going to train large language models. We're just going to make them bigger. We're going to train them on more data, and we're going to train them for longer. And that's exactly what they did. Um, so that I thought was interesting. Uh, just that, and that, that really was open AI, right? That, that was its, um, that was its, its mission. And they, they were very open. They were transparent about it. That's exactly what they did. And even the early versions of papers did have more detail than maybe the most recent paper too. So just getting back to those roots, I think is also something that 
is worth thinking about because People have more mixed feelings about uh, GPT, uh, ChatGPT now, partly because it just it's sucking up all the oxygen right now, and people are using it for things you probably shouldn't be using it for. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good point, and that that is what I think is interesting is that I think because there's sort of a way in which everyone it's it's accessibility to any person to be able to kind of play with and use kind of stands in for openness, but it it's not the same kind of openness that you're saying, you know, was more original to the project. Yeah, it's nuanced, definitely. And that, that was also new. So I said earlier that it was new to me when I saw that, like, wow, this thing really is uh, a broad, like it knows how to do lots of things. And I had typically focused on narrow use cases in the past, narrow. T- so that was new to me. The other thing that was new was basically the interface chat window. You type things in, it types things back. That does make it, like you're saying, like it, it, people didn't typically in the past get to interact with AI directly like that. They would they would see it through Amazon saying, okay, this is the ad. And the model for that, for what made it show you that ad was buried deep in the Amazon product and you would never see anything embarrassing. ChatGPT certainly wasn't Tay levels of embarrassing, but um, it was... It, it definitely has produced a lot of media attention, not all of it positive. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's actually, we actually, um, in one of our, in the conversation with my, with, with um, Eric Schleser, I believe we talked a little bit about um, da- philosopher Daniel Dennett and um, the notion of an intentional stance and the way that sort of we kind of project on things like ChatGPT. Um, this sort of assumption of sort of like a, a sort of anthropomorphism, basically, um, if that's the right term for it, but that we like kind of like the idea that there are people interacting with ChatGPT and kind of like feeling it as though it has human intelligence and, and has this kind of um, almost almost like a soul of sorts or agency or autonomy. But a lot of that is kind of actually partly because of our own cognitive biases and like what we're adding to it. Definitely. This is why it's so important to have these conversations across disciplines because, you know, lawyers, uh, philosophers, political scientists, like we all think about the idea of transparency, for example, but even just like defining what that is and what we want it to do. Um, if we really want kind of accountability, then you need to also then operationalize it and think about, well, what does that require? And so it's kind of also helpful to know, like from your perspective, what you think about replicability um, and, and that sort of like, there's sort of, it's not just like open in some, you know, superficial sense, but it is a, enabling certain forms of assessment and comparison that are useful to, 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 to everyone to some degree. Um, and so my understanding, okay. So now I, I kind of want to move us forward into what we kind of flagged earlier, which is the ex- existential risk question. Can I add one thing? Yes, before we go that? ahead. Definitely. Because I, we just talked about the importance of data and that being central to the recent AI advances. That's not the only thing. It's definitely a big deal. And it's often something that if it's held behind a proprietary moat, becomes very difficult to, to do things with, like re- reproduce the work and assess it. But beyond data, there was plenty of other things that made this recent revolution in AI possible. One is just the high performance commoditized hardware like graphics processing units. You know, NVIDIA's GPUs are pretty much what almost everybody uses to train and test these. And that in and of itself is something that we turned out we did need to get here. And also beyond just the hardware, NVIDIA made a specific investment in something called CUDA in 2006. Now, I do not give NVIDIA credit for seeing the future and saying, oh, CUDA will therefore make the, uh, this deep learning AI revolution happen. But that was quite a good bet uh, that they made. And that, that basically cornered the market for them for a long time because it made that hardware also accessible to developers. If you can't get the talent to write code to do compute on your GPUs, that's also it's kind of not all that helpful. The other thing that I've been talking about a little bit was open source, right? So one big deal was that AlexNet was open sourced. 
uh, CUDA comments, they, they release that BSD. I also mentioned a whole bunch of these. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say those very technical things again, but I am going to say there were some breakthroughs in the way they train deep neural nets that made them work in ways that they didn't before and initialize them, for instance. So I think, uh, I think those are the other things that I would add to like, yes, data is a piece of it and data is, I think probably the most important, but these other things also happen in parallel. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 that, that, that's really helpful actually. And important to talk about too. Um, I, so actually, and that actually reminded me, there was something else I want to talk about that, you know, often when people are talking about applying data collection and um, machine learning or some kind of automated technology is something that comes to mind for a lot of people is this idea of sort of the possibility of planning. Um, so for example, Amazon's dynamic pricing is seen as like, oh, wow, look at this kind of predictive analytics that they're able to do. Um, and is that somehow some sort of like kind of major economic shift? And I think that that what is crucial to some of the points that you've been making is something like Amazon, it has its own kind of data set of sorts, but also it has, um, it's a particular use case. So it's, it's very limited. So I guess, could you kind of give us a little bit of a window into why, you know, people who are so shocked by things like digital advertising, things like, you know, Amazon's predict predictions about what you would be interested in buying, um, why that doesn't necessarily become generalizable beyond, you know, the kind of the kind of environment, the context that Amazon is, is um, engaging with you in. So one thing I would say about Amazon's uh, pricing model, if you're using ML there, at the very least, they're using pricing data that they got from you on past transactions and you agreed to use your service. Yes, that's difficult and that can kind of funnel companies toward monopoly power because if they become the de facto standard for the marketplace, then they're the only ones that get that data, for instance. And that is in and of itself an issue. We do try and kind of, we, we have rules in the US about monopolies, for instance. So there's that issue. Um, and that issue of concentration of wealth and power by companies that use that data specifically for themselves. And did the people that were, when they were buying those things, did they want their data to, did they know that their data was going to be owned by Amazon to then use to, to price things for other people, for instance. So there's, there's that issue of consent by the people that are actually generating the data at scale. But that's also separate from some of the training that's been done by, say, OpenAI, for instance, because they they didn't generate any of that. Well, I, I, I shouldn't say that, but, but there are definitely lawsuits saying, hey, here's a New York Times article that's been plagiarized almost word for word that comes coming out of OpenAI's ChatGPT. That is a different, that's, that's a one level beyond even the concern of having monopoly market power with a like Amazon, for instance, but, but uh, go ahead. No, that's excellent. Actually, if you don't, if you want to expand on the copyright concerns and those, those lawsuits, I, I'd be happy to listen more because I think that that's a really important topic. Yeah. I think that they didn't, they didn't give the people whose data they were training on, they didn't give them an option to uh, say, no, don't train on my data. And, and because they don't say what data they trained on, it's just a question mark. Who knows if they trained on on your podcast, uh, for instance? Yeah, I know. I think about. I actually do think about that sometimes. Um, <laughs> and and also just the the. It is interesting how that obscurity is going to have kind of not, effects on the way people trust um, systems as well, and also potentially. This is what I we talked to a, another a lawyer, Salome uh, Phil Yoon, uh, recently. She'll be we'll be releasing her episode soon. But sh what I think was interesting is thinking about all the ways in which there's also social benefits that we might be missing out by not allowing people to give permission to be involved, to be able to participate collectively in a more open way, right? Like by not allowing academics to kind of be able to oversee or, or replicate, then we're actually also missing out on, on potential benefits. Definitely. And I'd also say, so I want to also talk about a different kind of 
it, Google was was hoovering up data too for years before OpenAI, and what they were doing was showing you small snippets of it, so you could click on it and go to their page, right? That's qualitatively different from what's happening with OpenAI. It, Google's it, basically finding things for people on the internet, like, hey, I I'm looking for this, and they say, oh, here you can go find it, and then those people, and Google definitely gets a lot of ad revenue for that, right? But that was arguably a service that did connect people that were looking for something and the, the uh, advertising dollars that was just a steep fee for that particular business model and that became entrenched. The difference with the OpenAI's GPT models is it can effectively plagiarize it and you're never going to talk to the actual source, like the people. So what incentivizes the content creator in that case? That I think is a is a qualitatively different type of monopoly power that Google didn't have. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's something very strange. It's such a strange time that we're in right now because we have all this, there was all this, um, and I'm not going to, you know, it's, uh, that's a whole other thing. But there is all this concern around academics or university administrators plagiarizing. But at the same time, we have, and I feel like it's actually distracting from this very kind of massive plagiarism threat, um, which is to say that the reason why, you know, in academics, we don't, so I don't necessarily, when I write a book, I'm not necessarily going to pay, although it does depend on how much content gets put in my book and whether or not I do have to compensate somebody for it. Like sometimes if you want a, a, an artwork or something published, you'll have to compensate. But the, 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 the key that I'm getting to is, is we as academics know that we got to cite properly when we, so if I'm publishing a book, I'm going to put all my citations, people I relied on. And even if I'm not paying that individual person, I, I will be selling my book to somebody or I'll be in a library. Hopefully <laughs> that's the dream. Um, but somebody will read it and they'll say, oh, well, that that resource sounds interesting that this person's just cited. I'll go buy that book. But without the kind of traceability, um, then there's not even going to be any kind of acknowledgement and any kind of pathway for somebody to eventually compensate the person whose data is being used in a, a more plagiaristic manner. I agree. I agree. I, 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 and I don't believe the, the law will catch up until we have conventions and standards to make that uh, mutual intent, like that, that consent, like, yes, you may use this for this amount of money until we have things that govern that. And, and we are nowhere near that. I, I don't hear many people talking about that. In fact, I've talked to IP people who think that that's probably not a great idea. But I, I think of those issues as, as like externalities. And we don't, we don't do a good job pricing externalities, period. And this is, this is a big externality for content. Yeah. So, and that, and that could be, so that could also be a whole other th road to go down, but I did kind of want to make sure we get to sort of uh, this kind of existential risk question, because I, I just think that that is important and, and I'll flag. So like one thing that's in the background here is that there was this backlash last year in the form of an open letter signed by um, at least a thousand people. Um, but, you know, I, at least, you know, I think it would headline grabbing because there'd be, there's signatures from Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak, and Jan LeCun calling for AI labs to commit to a pause in developing systems beyond the capacity of GPT-4 and even a government moratorium. And it seemed to me that what was at the heart of the call wasn't the concerns for kind of the risks we already see, uh, like bias or discrimination. Uh, or like the loan case that you brought up, um, but more speculative concerns with like the idea of, I don't know. So there's all these terms that people want. It. So that's what's funny about this term AI and why it, it's so overburdened with different meanings, because now that people use AI so much, people now want to specify, well, super intelligent AI or artificial general intelligence. And my understanding is, you know, this is a very speculative kind of image of AI, the sort of more sci-fi movie AI. Um, and I, I don't want to be too dismissive of it more generally, but I, I guess I, I would say that I come at it very suspicious of people calling for a moratorium, particularly because even you know, including if there is a risk, 
whether we want to entrench the current organizations that have the biggest advantages right now, um, who could better kind of comply with 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 a mator- moratorium, or also whether it just you know how do you even enforce a moratorium in the first place? A lot of issues with the practicability of it, um, even if people agree with the risk. But kind of getting getting you know f- first, let's just start with this idea of this existential risk. So, kind of what's your take on? How people are talking about this, um, and then, and also how this is a conversation. I think that re- really stands out. Why we want to be specific about the terms, how people are talking past each other, and why it can be really pernicious that people are talking past each other. Oh, I feel like if I answered that uh, on existential risk, I would be giving existential risk too much uh, airtime on your podcast because, like you pointed out, and Tim Nickabrew also points out. It's really a distraction. There are actual harms happening right now. And why is that not our focus? I think I would just go straight to that. And if we want to talk about existential risk, we then really have to ask compared to what? Like, what are the other existential risks? We have geopolitical events right now that could be existential risks. We have, I don't know, how, what's the likelihood an asteroid's going to? hit the the earth and end all life and then you prepare those and allocate resources accordingly uh just because something's popular right now i think we're giving it way more attention in terms of its uh existential risk you should definitely look at it yes and it definitely needs to be ethical but if it's not ethical already we should definitely fix that first. In, in yeah. My yeah. No, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Well, and I do think there's actually something kind of part of what is dangerous about the focus on the existential risk is that actually, so I, I we, and we don't, we don't have to discuss this. You know, it's very, very up to you. Um, but we were talking about before we had this, uh, uh, conversation we were exchanging about a monk debate on AI and existential risk. And what was kind of frustrating about the debate, we both, I think, felt that it really exemplified people talking past each other. And also just the way the debate was defined, it was essentially, you know, two, two proponents of the idea that AI does present an existential risk and two who defended that it doesn't. But it it was sort of a, um, as you put it actually in one of our in our correspondence um, it was a leading question to kind of put it this way because it was basically like if you think there's any even modicum possibility of an existential risk coming from AI then you have to kind of say that oh yeah and it also then kind of foreclosed the conversation from the less existential risks. Yep. Yep. And there's uh, I mean it also doesn't take into account benefits and harms but you have to. You have to weigh those and you have to weigh existential risks against other existential risks as well. So all of that, I thought, made the debate frustrating. And also during that debate, a lot of the time they were just redefining what they meant by existential risk and and kind of redefining what AI meant and what's automation. And I just didn't see the value of that debate as phrased the way they they phrase the the main question, it was frustrating. Yeah, yeah, and I, I actually what I was really struck by on some of your thoughts on that too was also um, and the, a line that stood out to me was also this comparison of of I guess because the idea that the brain we can we can think of the if we can think of the human brain as mechanistic in some way, then we should be able to build a machine that can replicate the human brain. But but that act carries with it a lot of interesting assumptions. I mean, you know, first I, I know when I heard that I was sort of, you know, do we know that we should think of the brain as a machine? Is that the best way to think of it? And you pointed out with that line this idea of we can kind of think of that, think of it in that way in theory, but in uh, in another way in practice, you know, our our human kind of experience is embodied. Um, it is very much about being uh, in relation with the physical world and with each other in really important ways. And so, whether or not you can totally replicate that is, I think, a much um, kind of bigger question. And maybe gets at some of the major differences between the ways kind of children. Uh, interact with the world versus these technologies interacting with the world. 
Yeah. Going back to when we were talking earlier about terminology, one of the phrases that drives me absolutely bonkers is when someone says, neural nets work like the human brain. I, think to, I roll my eyes. I think to myself, oh, so now we know how the human brain works. Because, because we don't. I, when I was at NIH, I was doing real neuroscience. I think neuroscientists are in violent agreement that we have no idea. Well, I don't know, say we don't know. We, don't, we, we cannot create a good model of the human brain. We can barely uh, even model parts of a mouse brain. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think it was Yashua Bengio that said that, like, oh, the, the brain is a machine, therefore it can be modeled. Yeah, fair, theoretically fair. But on a practical level, we have no such model. Like it could be, but we, we don't have that. We don't even know how, uh, how brains are wired. Like, and I'm not talking about a human brain. I'm talking about even like a one centimeter cubed mouse brain. We don't even know how those are wired. And once you have the wires, you then need to know where all the synapses are. And then what kinds of neurotransmitters go across those synapses and then model each of those. So we can model, yes, one neuron. We can model a handful of neurons. We can model one little part of the brain. But no, we are nowhere near having a useful model of the brain that we can run forward to say, all right, now do the things a brain does. So, so no, in practice, we don't have that. Uh, and I, I was about to respond to your point about uh, embodiment. Yes. And Jan LeCun has, I feel like a really good, uh, thoughtful argument about that in terms of what he calls a world model. Like we have a world model of how gravity works and how like when we pick up an object and put it down and move it and how if we uh, interact with the world, sometimes it interacts back with us um, because we're embodied. And that is something that we don't have in models like some people thought right away, oh, uh, ChatGPT exists. That's artificial general intelligence. It, it's not. And one of the reasons it's not is because it doesn't have a really good world model. So yes to the embodiment. And, and yeah, and I just, well, and so the one thing I did, I did appreciate that to some degree, this debate that we were talking about, um, Melanie Mitchell, I think did talk a little bit about, you know, how the existential risk question is distracting from these, these more everyday risks that we see and dangers. And so I was wondering, I wanted to give you more of a chance to kind of talk more about those, um, especially because you're going to be, I think, you know, you have the nice mix of expertise that you have that I think could, would be helpful to kind of give us a window into those, those risks, like what should people be thinking about instead of the existential risk question? I mean, I, I, I think the harms that are already happening because of the AI models that we use every day. And if I just had one thing that I would, I would say, it's that those models make mistakes and those models with humans together make mistakes and the humans themselves made mistakes. So loan uh, approvals weren't weren't perfect before uh, they started using machine learning for it. But what we should do is start formalizing all of those risk indicators like that we were talking about, like the fairness, accountability, transparency, make those as formalized as possible. Those performance metrics, which again was historically the thing that, that made this deep learning revolution important in, in a market sense today, track those performances before AI, with AI, and even if, if you want to use AI by itself. But you should have a way to compare these things apples to apples on those ethical things that that society values. And what's great about ML is you can say, like ML is really only two lines of code. It's, and this comes from Cassie Kozakoff. I mean, she, she might've got it from somewhere else, but uh, it is train this model on this data set um, to, to optimize this criterion. Optimize this criterion, there are many of them. I mentioned Things like, you know, making something better, faster, cheaper, there are three criteria right there because make something better if, say, you were willing to wait longer for it, for instance, right? So that they might trade off against each other. But makes, that's what people often talk about. But you also have to talk about all the other things that you need to have in place in order to launch an ML model into production. Those are transparency, fairness, accountability, privacy, security, safety, et cetera. Um, and to, to their credit, the recent, so the, the Facebook 
Llama 2 paper really did go into this is how we this is how we made sure this was safe. So more of that and accuracy is super important. If you get things wrong, people are going to get hurt. And that's happening right now. I think this focus on, hey, I'm afraid of Terminator ro- robots. Um, I, 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 I do see that as real because it could happen theoretically and you do want to protect against it but it needs to be calibrated against all the other existential risks that you might have that you want to deal with. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciated, I think, a line uh, that Melanie Mitchell had in that debate that was about, uh, you know, science in general carries existential risk. We've seen it, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't. <laughs> what, what about all the risks of not pursuing scientific inquiry? Yeah, that was a brilliant line. Brilliant. Yeah. And I, and I, and, um, and I think again, and I, again, um, why I guess we can't totally shy away from these conversations and by, and, and having them in a kind of collaborative and interdisciplinary way, because I think any policy that does get designed has to be designed, um, intelligently, um, with actual kind of, uh, accurate, handle on the facts and then of, of the case, but then also being shaped by, I think, all sorts of people, stakeholders that might not get a voice in all, at all times. Um, if, if you limit it only to kind of the biggest players or um, people with the, the best lobbying resources, things like that. Great. Well, I think that that's an excellent conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm so pleased that you chatted with us. Uh, I feel like I I definitely feel like I have a better handle on these issues. And also, I think in a way that is retains, I think, kind of skepticism and and the ability to not get totally caught up in the hype um, around these questions and and focus on, okay, the here and now of what we're dealing with. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about this. And I'll talk to me like this about what I think of as some of the most mundane, boring things. Uh, and yet they, they can be super important in our in our discourse. So I appreciate you focusing on that because I think there's not enough of that in our our modern discourse right now. So thank you very much for that. Oh, wow. Thank you. Well, that means a lot. And um, I'm so grateful again to you for being so generous with your time. Yeah, happy to. episode with philosopher Eric Schließer, we discussed the concept of the intentional stance from Daniel Dennett. This referred to the tendency that we have as humans to anthropomorphize other entities, to ascribe to them, whether animals or a large language model, agency and sentience, features that would make them similar to us. I want to focus the final comments on this episode with that concept, because I think that how we design and how we talk about technologies can encourage or discourage this tendency to our detriment, potentially making us trust and defer to programs in ways that aren't merited. By breaking down the category of artificial intelligence into more precise terms, John explained that many programs like ChatGPT are machine learning systems computer models which find and use patterns and data. Supervised learning refers to the use of a training set of data labeled with inputs and correct outputs to enable the model to adjust its accuracy over time. Deep learning usually refers to a model relying on neural networks in multiple layers to process data. Automation in the sense of automated programs doesn't necessarily require machine learning, as it can just be done using code, such as using code to coordinate a automated email reply. But when people start getting worried about AI is when a, we imagine a system that acts with some agency in response to the environment. And that is autonomy going beyond automation. When we talk about machine learning use cases, we are talking about applying machine learning to assist in the automation of specific narrow tasks, tasks with some specific kinds of inputs and outputs. Those are use cases. 
In a computer vision use case of object recognition, for example, the input might be a photo and the output might be a text label corresponding to an object class in a bounding box of that photo. Reviewing John's 30 years of professional experience in AI, there were a number of important developments that helped bring us to where we are today. Large labeled data sets were essential for the development of machine learning models. A particularly important example is the ImageNet dataset, curated by a team of scientists, including Dr. Fei-Fei Li. John really wanted to underscore the academic courage of Fei-Fei Li and the group that created this dataset, because while it did not have the academic novelty of a new model architecture, it has been a long-lasting gift to the field. While models have been developed over time, some surpassing the earlier models in terms of error rates, the ImageNet dataset remains essential. That this data set and codes that computer vision labs were using were open source also enabled massive progress in the machine learning discipline and deep learning in particular. Improvements in hardware power, such as by NVIDIA's graphic processing units were also key, according to John. To explore the value of openness and transparency as useful ideals in scholarship and scientific progress, John and I emphasize the importance of replicability or reproducibility. Scholars making publicly available information about the training data they used, as well as their model, enables others to use other benchmark data sets to test and hopefully get the same results that the scholars report. When evaluating a model, scientists must be sure that the data they use to test the model is mutually exclusive from the data that was used to train the model in the first place. Transparency about training data helps people evaluate each other's models. So to take OpenAI's ChatGPT as an example, third-party scientists who are not privy to proprietary information face two major challenges in trying to assess the large language model. First, because there is a lack of transparency around what constitutes the training data, a third-party scientist can't be sure if a data set she uses to test ChatGPT contains data that ChatGPT was already trained on and memorized, so to speak. Second, ChatGPT is broadly accessible through a simple user interface and can produce all sorts of text-based outputs, from coding to summarizing 18th century philosophy. It's more of a jack of all trades than a more traditional machine learning model that treats a single, very narrow use case or task. This breadth of capabilities also makes it more difficult to develop a suitably narrow or wide benchmark to evaluate ChatGPT's capabilities. Indeed, ChatGPT needs to be evaluated with a battery of tests that span inputs and correct outputs from many representative use cases. And evaluators also need to be certain for all those use cases, the answers to those tests weren't seen in training as well. While we do not know the entirety of ChatGPT's training data, we know one of the sources was the pile data set of text scraped from the internet. The ambiguity about the training data and the possibility that the data comes from copyrighted texts without the consent of their authors has been used by those authors and publishers to mount lawsuits. Regardless of the legality question, it is certainly a part of the ethical debates around these technologies that authors don't know whether their material is being used and reproduced via these models without credit or compensation. As we discussed in our episode with Salome Filyun, the issue of complicity is always involved in these debates, whether I have created something that ends up being used towards some form of discrimination or injustice despite my opposition. It's important to think about problems of bias and discrimination because these already exist in current programs. They're not just a speculative risk in the future. John highlighted the work of Dr. Timnit Gebru, a computer scientist who works in the ethics of AI and is the founder of the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute. She has cited the 2016 ProPublica report on judges' use of predictive analytics in sentencing decisions as an influence on her career. This report compared a model's predictions with actual reoffending rates and found that the model was more likely to rate Black defendants who did not reoffend as high risk and to rate white defendants who went on to reoffend as low risk, 
rather than being accurately predictive. The study illustrates how historical inequalities can shape training data that ends up further building in and retrenching those same inequalities into the predictive analytics systems. If we are starting to think about the potential for existential risks in AI, or what some people have started saying is artificial general intelligence, or AGI, it's important to keep in mind how some of the most striking examples of technological power in our daily lives are still very much embedded in our current political economy, rather than simply inherent to a given model. So for example, Amazon's dynamic pricing depends on a vast amount of data collected about users, consumers, producers, regarding exchanges via their own marketplace. While John and I wanted to focus on the more ordinary and existing risks and harms of technologies, I do want to note one of the key concepts that is important to those who are speculating about existential risk, the alignment problem. The alignment problem refers to the challenges scientists face in terms of properly encoding automated programs to achieve specific and intended objectives and to do so in a manner consistent with ethical values that won't be misinterpreted by the system. This would be particularly important if those systems are autonomous with the capacity to coordinate multiple tasks without human intervention. But as John and I focused on, we need to make sure that being concerned about these more speculative issues don't ignore, neglect, or distract from pre-existing ethical concerns we face with current technologies, which may be far less technically powerful, but are nevertheless politically influential with major implications for people today. These systems are always embedded in our social and political lives and shaped by decisions that we are making as a whole community together. I'm so grateful to John for sharing his insights with us and for doing so in a manner that is so clear and easy to understand. And I'm so grateful to you for joining us. Till next time.